Good morning, everyone. There's bright lights up here. My name is Andrew Caliaris, and I'm one of the um, partners in charge of our private equity practice at Rothstein Cass. And we're very excited to be the co-host of this terrific conference. And those of you who aren't familiar with Rothstein Cass, we provide audit tax and advisory services to hedge funds, fund of funds, private equity, and venture capital funds. And recently, we're proud to say that Hedge Week USA has recognized Rothstein Cass as one of the best accounting um, firms serving the financial services industry. But enough about us. I'm here to introduce our first speaker of Partner Connect 2013, Mark Yusko, is the founder of, and CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Morgan Creek Capital Management. Mr. Yusko formed Morgan Creek in 2004 to provide investment management and advisory services based on the university endow endowment model of investing to a diverse client base of institutional partners and family offices. With approximately $7 billion in assets under advisement, the firm invests across all asset classes and strategies from traditional equities and fixed income to alternatives such as hedge funds, private equity, real estate, and venture capital. Prior to Morgan Creek, Mr. Yusko was Chief Investment Officer for the Endowment for the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's UNC Management Company. And prior to that, he was a Senior Investment Director at the University of Notre Dame Investment Office. And always a dynamic spe speaker, please help me welcome Mark Yusko. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I guess the, the nice thing about going first in the morning is we have a nice, small, intimate crowd, and we can talk about a lot of different things. The other fun thing is um, I won't have to talk too much about basketball this year, uh, except our women are going to be in the Final Four, so that's pretty good. Notre Dame women will be in the Final Four. Took care of Duke last night, or the University of New Jersey at Durham, as I call them so affectionately. So uh, I'm going to do a little speed slide presentation this morning to get everybody waked up, to, to get everybody woken up and uh, hit on a bunch of topics and see if there's some things that uh, you guys want to talk about. I titled the, the speech Surviving in the Age of Financial Repression, and I saw a great graphic last night, and I put it in a presentation I'm doing next week, but I couldn't uh, fit it in this morning. But it showed if you took a stack of dollar bills, okay, 480000 high, and that's what you used to make on a $10 million investment over the course of a year if you put it in a two-year treasury. Today, you make 24000 And the two stacks are massively different. And that's financial repression. Think about that. If you had $10 million in the bank, OK, five, six, seven years ago, you could make half a million dollars a year just for hanging around. Today, you make $24,000. So it's not enough to live on. So people that thought they were wealthy now don't feel so wealthy. So they're having to look for other things. So in this age of financial repression, we've got to think differently about how we invest. I'm going to think differently about how we make the slides work. There we go. So first quote, plan conceived in moderation must fail when circumstances are set in extremes. I used to use the example of sailing. I have a better example. Some of you have heard this before. As my wife and I planned for 19 years what we're going to do with all of our free time because we were dropping off our son at college. Our daughter was already graduating. And we thought we were going to have all this free time as empty nesters. Well, we have a two-year-old now, so that plan is kind of out the window. So everyone thinks about investing the same way. So real quickly, this is what has happened to your money if you've left it in US equities, international equities, developed market equities since 2000. Since the tech bubble in 2000, this is the first of the bubbles occurred, if you invested your money in US equities, that's financial repression. You've made the princely sum of zero. There's a technical term for that. That sucks. Gold and silver made you five times your money. Now, gold and silver got monkey hammered yesterday, down 4%. Everybody's saying, oh, gold's going back you know, under $1,000. But think about it. Over the course of this 12-year period, equities made you nothing. Now, why is that? Well, we now live in what I call the new abnormal. You know, people talk about the new normal, and the guys from PIMCO all coined that term. I actually don't think it's normal at all. If you think back from 1980 to 1999, 19 years, that same amount of time that my wife and I thought we were going to have all this free time together, that 19-year period, from 19 to 19, 1980 to 1999, it was easy to invest. The market went up six years out of seven. It almost never went down. When it went down, it hardly went down at all. But since then, since 2000, the market goes down one out of every three years. And when it goes down, it goes down a lot. And in fact, um, Mark Faber the other day came out and said they're going to be two. No, maybe it, was, maybe it wasn't Mark Faber. Maybe it was um, 
Jim, I can't, it was one of the big, big commentators said, there can be two 50% drops in the next decade in the U.S. market. And we'll have this down, up, down, up, down, up that we've had up to this point. But if you look, the average intra-year drop, there's been a 20% correction every year for the last four years. And we're probably on the verge of one, which we'll get to in a little bit. If you look over the last 12 years, that security market line in red, cash outperformed stocks. Just think about that for a second. Cash outperformed our beloved stocks. Now, how many people in this room have their biggest asset? I won't make you raise your hand, actually. Have your largest allocation to U.S. equities? Your 401k, a lot of you are in private equity or venture capital, you have big investments there. But most people have the bulk of their money in equities, and I can't figure out why. How many people have more money in emerging markets than they do in the U.S.? Hardly anybody. Emerging markets compounded 14% a year for the last 12 years. That's better than two. It just is. Now, if you went to Yale's website and pulled up their annual report, which is a good one, you'd see that Yale today has 68% of their endowment in real assets, private investments, and hedge funds. 68%. Now, the average investor on the far left in gray has 55% of their money in U.S. public stocks. One of those two is wrong for the next 10 years. Now, we know over the last 10 years, that green box, we know that the endowment's compounded at 10%, 8 to 10%, instead of 2 to 3%, like a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds. 10 is better than 3. In fact, instead of having a buck 50, you have 3 bucks. So, for 20 years, now people say 20 years, 10 years isn't that long, but 20 years is a long time. In fact, I'm going to be going back to graduation in 20 years. I'll be 70, which is the new 50, and that's cool. But I'll be going back to graduation in 20 years. 20 years, look at private equity up top. Private equity compounded about 14%. Hedge funds compounded about 12%. Now, if you look at that over the long term, long short equity. Everybody says hedge funds are dead. Everybody should get out of hedge funds, even though there's a record amount of money going into hedge funds. But we'll ignore that. The press says that hedge funds are dead. Long only lives forever. Long only is the best way to invest. Not according to this. Over 20 years, long only took you from a dollar to four dollars. Long short, and this is the average long short. This isn't the good guys, because the good guys don't even report. Everybody says, oh, these numbers are flawed because they have survivor bias. Yes, they do have survivor bias, but they also have reporting bias in that the best of the best, the Blue Ridges and the, and the um, Lone Pines, don't actually report to this number. So this number was actually probably understated rather than overstated, but let's just say it's approximately right. You made 12 times your money instead of four times your money. And how did you do it? You did it by paying attention to the three rules of managing money. One, don't lose money. Two, don't lose money. Three, don't forget the first two rules. Think about it today. Why would you risk your investments? Why would you risk your assets, your livelihood, your life savings? Why would you risk that in an asset that has very unlikely outcomes of making money in the developed world. If you look at the amount of debt, you guys are, many of you in the private equity business, if you think about a company that has more debt than assets, their equity value is what? I only took one accounting class in college. I went to Notre Dame, I took accounting over at St. Mary's College, me and 31 girls. I joke it wasn't, I don't remember a lot of accounting, I remember a lot of numbers. But I do remember one accounting identity. Assets equals liabilities plus owner and equity. You guys realize that the United States has more government debt than global GDP? Just let that sink in for a second. The United States of America, one country, has more debt than the entire global GDP. That's a frightening thought. And that doesn't even include all of our liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, prescription drugs, and phony and fraudy. That's Fannie and Freddie. That's 80 trillion bucks. See, I love it. No one shudders when I say T, trillion. You guys all know what a trillion is, right? You all have to sit there with me for the next 31.7 years, it'd be very unpleasant, and you have to spend $1,000 a second to get one trillion. That's just one, not the 80. So this doesn't end well. So why does everybody have this portfolio? Why does everybody have most of their money in stocks? Don't know. In fact, there's a great paper. Go to Crestmont Research, a little homework assignment. Go to CrestmontResearch.com tonight and pull up a paper waiting for average. And it says, from here, how long will you have to wait to make the average return on stocks of 10%? Because you, you make returns on stocks three, four ways. You get inflation, you get dividends, you get multiple expansion, and you get earnings growth, real earnings growth, which is always 1% less than GDP growth. 
If you look today going forward, inflation is very low, sub 2%. We'll call it 2% to round it. Dividends are pathetic at 2%. Earnings growth is going to be 1% less than GDP. GDP is going to struggle to make 2% over the next decade. That's one. And there's no way multiples expand because they've been above average for 20 years. So at best, you make five. So there's nothing so dangerous as following a rational investment policy in an irrational world. So, but the problem is markets can behave irrationally longer than the rational investor can remain solvent. So why are we here? We're here because of debt. We created the biggest debt bubble in history. There it is. Okay? And everyone thinks that we're deleveraging. And we have delevered a little bit, but all we've done is displace private market debt with public market debt. The problem with public market debt is as a negative multiplier. It actually reduces growth. Think about it. If in 2007, you had $10 million, and you deposit it in, in two-year treasuries, and you made $480,000, you probably spent a bunch of that. Today, if you make $24,000, how much more wealth do you have? How much more spending do you have? How much more growth do you have? The answer is none to all of those things. So it is the 1930s. It's probably right about 1937. So we had the recovery after 1932. We had the fall of 1929, like 2007, 8. But we've seen this movie before. Back in 1929, we had a massive budget deficit. Of course, the one today makes the last one look like a piker. We cut interest rates to zero to try to stimulate growth. No one would buy our debt because we're an emerging market run by a gang called the Mafia. So we had to buy our own debt. We did something called quantitative easing for the first time. And what happened? Interest rates stayed zero until 1949. For 20 years, everyone says, when are interest, interest rates going to go up? They're not. You can't finance your debt if interest rates rise. And we've seen this movie. Japan's interest rates used to be 7%. On the right-hand side, back in 1989, their stock market was 39,000. If you went to Harvard Business School across the river, when you went to Harvard Business School, they sent you to Tokyo to learn about Japan Inc. Now they don't send you there anymore, but they, maybe they should. Because over the past 10 years, interest rates in Japan have been less than 1%. Ten-year rate just hit a new low at 0.52. So once you get down, once your debt gets downgraded, once you have too much debt, you can't get out of this liquidity trap, and it's not going to change this time. So once the deleveraging starts, it averages 17 to 18 years. We're about four years into it. So get used to low rates. The market tends to react to that. Stocks don't make very much. If the cost of capital is zero, the return on capital is zero. And so we have cost of capital today at zero. Interest rates are going to stay very low for a very long time. No way to get out of it because you're trapped. Think about this. The reason Tim Geithner retired, not because he was tired, is because he had to refinance $4 trillion over the next two years with an average cost of 1.41%. That's a frightening thought. Think about what would happen if interest rates went to 3 or 4%. It can't happen. So it's not going to happen. So interest rates are going to stay low. So Jeremy Grantham down the street put this up. The days of 3% GDP growth are gone forever. Now, I'm going to be proven wrong, because in the first quarter, because of some seasonal adjustment stuff and some funny number fudging, is probably going to hit somewhere close to 3% because we had the decline in the fourth quarter. But after that, the days of 3% GDP growth in the United States are gone forever. And he goes through a very, again, go to his website, get the paper on this. He explains it better than I do. But it's because of de-financialization. We created this leverage bubble. We did a big leverage buyout on the United States. And the bill is coming due. And it's worse in Europe, and we'll get to that in a second. So how do you make money? How do you make money? We always make the most money when you take a view that is different from everybody else. In fact, Michael Steinhardt coined this term, and he used to say that he would ask his analysts four things. In two minutes, you had to tell them your idea, the consensus view, your variant perception, which is a well-rounded view that is meaningfully different than consensus, and a trigger event. And if you couldn't do that, he had no time for you. So you have to come up with variant perceptions if you're going to make the big money. So is the S&P nearing an inflection point? The S&P is at the same level it was 12 years ago. You've made no money for 12 years. Had a big loss, down 50 plus percent, then 100 percent rise, then down 50 plus percent, then 100 percent plus rise, 128 percent. Today we're at 15.9 times forward earnings, which has only been more expensive 14 percent of the time in history. And two-thirds of that time was in the Great Depression, which really doesn't count. 
So on the left-hand side bottom, the Schiller PE says, get the heck out, fourth most expensive we've ever been in history. The right-hand side says the earnings yield means you should buy stocks because the earnings yield is so much higher than interest rates. Earnings yield is a bogus concept. You don't get paid earnings yield. There's no such thing as earnings yield. Earnings yield, actually, who does it go to? It goes to management teams. That's who gets the earnings yield because they get, pay themselves stock options and big dividends and big salaries, and that's where the earnings yield goes. You actually don't get earnings yield. You only get yield yield, dividend yield. So the concept of earnings yield is just bogus, but people use it to justify high stock prices. If you look on the left-hand side, every measure of valuation is between 40 and 60% above average. Now, it could go to 70% above average. The irrational can be, it can be irrational. And on the bottom right is that 86% of the time it's been less expensive 86% of the time, only more expensive 14% of the time. Human beings do one thing really, really well. They buy what they wish they would have bought. And we're really good at it. So the biggest inflow into US equities in history happened when? In April of 2000. 85% of all the money ever invested in technology mutual funds came in in four months. January, February, March, and April of 2000. Everybody bought Cisco at 100. Right? In fact, I'd always do this. I want to do an auction. Okay? Here's a dollar bill. Opening bids, 286 bucks. Who's going to pay me 286 bucks for this? That's what you did when you bought Cisco. Now, when you buy Amazon.com or Amazon.bomb, as I like to call it, you're paying $14,000 for every dollar of earnings because they had a really bad quarter. But maybe it's only 700 if you gave them some average over the last couple of years. That doesn't end well. In fact, when you pay $286 for Cisco's earnings in 2000, how long did you have to live to make a 10% return? 1,083 years. If you know how to do that, don't tell anyone. Shoot me an email. We'll do fountainyouth.com together. So what happened is all the money went in in April 2000. Where'd Cisco go from 100? Went down to 8. Now it's 21 and people are happy. You say, well, why are you happy? Well, it's not 8. But you paid 100. Well, as soon as I get even, then I'll get out. You're never getting even. Never, ever, ever. You can wait till the end of time. Cisco stock will never be $100 again. You can wait till the end of time. When was the second biggest inflow into US equities in the last two decades? Just the other month. After the market went up 128%, nobody bought stocks in March of 2009. Nobody. Massive outflows. You can see the chart. The biggest outflows ever in history. Because people always sell what they're going to need. And they buy what they wish they would have bought. So after stocks went up 100%, now suddenly people think it's a good time to get in. So Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. If you look at negative net worth and margin debt, they've only been at this level twice in history, in 2001 and 2007. In both cases, the next year, we lost a lot of money. Doesn't have to happen, but it probably will. So what do you do? You got to get hedged. You must get hedged. But people say, I don't want to get hedged. Hedge funds have, out, have sucked for the last three years. Well, of course they do. It's cyclical. If you go back to 1995 to 19, I mean, 1996 to 1999, hedge funds underperformed because they were inflating the bubble around Y2K. Then from 2000 to 2002, hedge funds outperformed. Then they pumped a trillion dollars in the economy. As Buffett said, give me a trillion dollars. I'll show you a good time, too. They inflated the economy after the uh, invasion of Iraq. And suddenly, hedge funds underperformed. They still made money. Then from 2006 to 2009, they outperformed. From 2009 to 2012, they underperformed. The problem is, if I don't have the slide. If you held stocks over the last 20 years, just bought stocks and held them, you made 8%. If you bought bonds and held them, you made 7%. But what did the average investor do? They tried to market time between the two. How much did the average investor make over 20 years? Two because they always buy what they wish they would have bought. So everybody's piling into long only instead of buying hedged here. So a variant perception, everyone says that everything's great, the US is great, it's best house in a bad neighborhood, everything's fantastic. A variant perception is sometime in April, May, I'm sorry, we're already in April, in May, June, we could see a recession. Everyone says that's impossible. Well, there's some red at the bottom of this chart that says three of the four big four indicators are starting to look a little recession-y. So that's a variant perception. Everybody says housing is recovering. It's a big housing recovery. The problem is, without the seasonal adjustment in the upper left-hand corner, there hasn't been any recovery at all. 
And the seasonal adjustment doesn't really make sense because it's cold. Global warming, that's crap. It's cold outside. Okay? Housing employment has actually fallen. Housing is only 3% of GDP. I'm just talking about housing like it's some big deal. It's 3% of GDP. Who cares? New generation isn't going to buy. My daughter, who's 24, says she is never going to buy a house. That's what she told me. She says, I'm never going to buy a house. Now, maybe she'll change her mind. She gets married and has kids, but she's, she doesn't want to own. She wants to rent. So everybody says the bond bull market's over. Interest rates are going up. Van Hoisden, anyone, anyone know Van? Van Hoisden, Austin, Texas. He's made two trades in 30 years. He's compounded almost 20% for 30 years. He made two trades. Back in the 70s, he traded out of long bonds into cash to get out of a way of inflation. And then in 1992, he traded from cash back to long bonds. He's been in long bonds ever since. He's compounded almost 20%. And he's going to stay along long bonds because interest rates are not going up. They're going to trading, they're going to have a range, but they're eventually going to chug down because we have too much debt. Analysts, analysts think we're going to make $110 this year in the S&P. Not a chance. No way. It'll be less than $100, probably $96, $97. Bucks. That is not in prices today. European debt. European, I have a friend, I was telling somebody earlier, I have a friend who lives in Spain. He works out of Spain. Spain is so bad, you, we can't even comprehend how bad it is. Their banks, done. The equity of those banks, gone. What happened in Cyprus? Cyprus is such a big deal because it's a really big deal. And what's happening when you tax wealth, when you steal wealth, think about being a business owner in Cyprus. The Russian oligarchs are trying to punish. Well, what if you're just a business owner that was running a hotel and you put all your money in the bank and now it's gone? How are you going to make payroll? How are you going to buy food? How are you going to pay for the oil to put in your, I mean, the gas to put in your car? So this is starting to spiral out of control. And if you look at the PMIs and if you look at the GDP, it's collapsing. PMIs are sub 45, not sub 50, they're sub 45. They've been in a recession now going on a year. And everybody says, oh, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's not getting better. And it's not going to get better. Variant perception. China. China actually is getting better. PMIs are actually turned up. We actually see some green shoots. It's probably not a massive fraud. There probably is some fraud. There's fraud everywhere. There's fraud here. There's fraud there. But it's probably not a massive fraud. So buying A shares that nobody wants to buy, probably an interesting idea. Japan, the last time they did this, the last time they reflated from 2003 to 2007, the market went up 140%. The time before that, 1998, it doubled. They have a lot of room. The Bank of Japan's balance sheet in blue on the right-hand side is way smaller than the United States and Europe's. They can buy a lot of bonds. They can trigger a lot of inflation, and it's probably going to work. The yen probably goes to 110. The new target right now is about 99. Eventually, it's going to go to 150, and stocks are going to follow. Probably the best developed market by far will be Japan over the next few years. Creative risk-taking is essential to success, and they go where the stakes are high. Jeremy Grantham right down the road says, if you stay in stocks and bonds over the next seven years, you make a negative real return. That's not very good. So what do you got to do? You got to look at other things. Liquid investments like hedge funds, illiquid investments like private investments. The problem is the old days are gone. We used to get 4% from cash, 6% from bonds, 2% for their credit risk premium, another 5 to make 11 in stocks, and you got 16 from private. Awesome. Private equity rocks. You can hear from David and others talk about it. It's great. The problem is that's the past. Today, cash pays zero, bonds pay two, equities at best are five. Jeremy would say zero, but at best five. Unless you go to emerging markets where you can make 11. Private, you still make 15 to 20 because you only have five things, six things that you can do. Anyone named Soros? Never is. Okay, so don't do number one. Market timing is too hard. Anyone trade 26 times a microsecond? If you can't do that, then don't try to trade because the high frequency traders will kick your butt. You know what the sharp ratio is of high frequency trading? 11. It's very profitable for Citadel and others. So you can go to cash, which you get a negative real return. You can go in liquid, which we love. In fact, if you have a 20% allocation of private, go to 40. If you have 40, go to 80. That's where all the money is going to be made going forward. Leverage, you can't get it, so it doesn't really matter. And you have to innovate to make money here. So if you're going to innovate, where are you going to invest? Where there's growth. Where's all the growth? Not in the United States, Europe, and Japan. Those are the submerging markets. They'll sell more adult diapers than baby diapers this year in Japan. But that's not the point. They're going to reflate. And there are corporations that are exporting to China, like company Unicharm that makes diapers. They're going to sell adult diapers to the Japanese and baby diapers to the Chinese. They're going to make a lot, a lot of money. So skip that slide, skip that slide. Private investments. If you think about private investing, 
private investing, there are certain strategies that make a lot of sense. The strategy that we see that makes the most sense is Asian growth. Where's all the growth going to be? A billion people in Asia are going to turn 40 in the next 20 years. They're going to buy a lot of stuff. So get in front of it. So this is a portfolio that we put together over the years. And we own things. We own copper mines in Papua New Guinea. We own gold mines in Australia. We own platinum and silver, platinum and palladium mines in South Africa. I'm not sure of a lot. My wife says I'm frequently wrong, never in doubt. But I'm not sure of a lot. But I'm sure they're going to put more cars on the road in China in the next 30 years than all the cars and trucks manufactured in the history of the United States. And they're all going to use platinum and palladium. So it's pretty interesting. Meat, big, biggest meat processor in China. We owned a little piece of a company called Facebook in the private markets. It was better, it turns out it's better to own it at $11 and sell at the IPO than to buy it at the IPO. It just was better. So here's your conundrum, 035 conundrum. Cash pays to zero, bonds pay three, stocks at best are five. Mix it up any way you want. How much are you going to make? Less than five, probably three and a half. You can move out the security market line by investing in emerging markets, hedge funds, and private. If you look like one of the big endowments, like the guys down the street, Jane will tell you about it later, her portfolio does not look like a 60-40 portfolio. If you look like that portfolio, you have a chance to make 8 to 10. You guys have been great. I have to put this slide up because for every engineer we graduate in the United States, South Korea graduates 17. For every lawyer they graduate, we graduate 40. Because they are a country of wealth creation. We're a country of wealth redistribution. So thanks a lot. I'll see you guys later.